and there. Okay, so continuing. So this is the text representation of what a conditional statement looks like in pseudocode, but it looks about the same in almost all programming languages. The only minor differences would be in some languages, in most programming languages, there's no such uh, phrase of and if to mark the end of a conditional statement. So you probably will be wondering like, well, if we don't have an end if to mark the end of a conditional statement, how do we know? How does the compiler know where the end of a conditional statement is? So we'll spend a little bit of time to talk about the syntax, you know, um, that is specific to CISP 360 later on. But right now, we just need to know that there are three components. And when you look at the three components as a picture, it kind of looks like this. I know my you know, drawing is not really the best, but it kind of shows you the three components. The first thing you do is you uh, present, you're presented the condition, then you evaluate it. A condition is, a, is an expression, but when you evaluate that expression, it would either give you an answer of true or an answer of false. Depending on which one it is, you choose one of these two paths. If it is true, you choose this particular path here, and then you execute the portion that is between the, the word then and the word else. If the answer is false to this condition, then you follow the other branch, and you'll be executing the statements that are between the word else and the words and if. So that is kind of the correspondence between a pictorial picture of what a conditional statement is, and also the text representation of a conditional statement. So do we have any questions up to this point of you know, the structure of a conditional statement and also what each part of a conditional, conditional statement does? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, very good. <clears throat> we talked about the pseudocode to find the maximum of two variables and store the maximum into Z, which is the code that we are looking at right now in listing one. Do we have any questions about that? because we trace that at the end of the previous class to illustrate how it works, okay? <clears throat> so if there are no questions about this, then we can move on, and then we'll start to talk about logical operators. So before we talk about log logical operators, we'll use an example to illustrate you know, why we need logical operators. So what we want to do is to have a slightly different problem now, which is to figure out the maximum of three variables now and store the maximum of the three into Z. So we started off with only two variables. Now we are extending it to include three variables. So our job is now to figure out you know, um, the maximum of the three variables and then store that value into Z. So using conditional statements, you can see that we have a little bit of a template of a code already. We know that sometimes w is the maximum of the three, so we store the value of w into z. Um, sometimes x is the maximum of the three, so we store the value of x into z, and sometimes y is the maximum, and we store the value of y into z. So it kind of makes sense that your know, lines two, four, and six would be a part of that whole thing, because prior to the comparisons and whatnot, <clears throat> we do not know which one is the maximum, okay? But now the question is, well, how do we formulate C1 and C2? C1 is just a placeholder representing that this is a condition, okay? And C2 is representing another condition. <clears throat> um, we have never really talked about, you know, what is how we deal with you know, the, uh, the phrase else if. So what, we'll do, what I'll do is I'm gonna jump a little bit out of sequence here and give you a picture of you know, the logic or the flow of this uh, construct first. So just kind of remember C1 and C2 um, in this particular text representation. And I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit to a picture of that particular statement. <clears throat> this is the kind of like a trail map representation of the else if, else if, else type of structure. So the first condition, which is C1, is condition one here. This is the first condition to be evaluated. Okay, you know, I, I think most people would not have a problem with that. 
but here comes the part that is kind of important. If C1 is true, then we execute whatever is right after specified, right after line one. <clears throat> and when that, when that is done, we exit right away. Okay, so if C1 is true, we do not even bother to evaluate C2. Is that okay? Now, what if C1 is false? If C1 is false, we follow this path, you know, labeled false, then we evaluate C2, or the second condition. If the second condition is true, then we evaluate this portion here, which is kind of confusing because it says else then. Because the first else corresponds to the first condition. It is the first condition evaluates to false. The then refers to condition two, because condition evaluates to true. Is that okay? So we get here because condition one is false, but condition two is true. How do we end up here? Condition one and condition two are both false. Very good. <clears throat> so this is the structure corresponding to the code that we saw earlier. But it, it still doesn't answer the question of what should we use as C1 and what should we use as C2. So let me scroll back to this part here. How can you confirm that out of three variables, W is the largest of the three? Hmm? Um, we need something in addition to what we already have, right? So you have to say, you know, W has to be greater than X and W has to be greater than one, okay? So we have to introduce the concept of A and D and, yes? Um, would you not want to use greater than equal to in case? Greater than or equal to will work as well. Yeah, so in this case, you can use greater than or greater than or equal to, they both will work. <clears throat> um, when we get to C2, it is actually simpler because in C2, um, even though we can kind of use the logic to confirm that x is the largest, but at this point we already know w is not the largest. So we can kind of rule out w, and we only have two candidates to be the largest um, when we get to line three, because if we get to that means um, we know that w is not the maximum. So we can use a single comparison in that case. But the idea is C1 does involve what we call a Boolean operator. And in this case, that Boolean operator is AND, A-N-D, which is also known as conjunction. So the rest, you know, so the next few, well, maybe the next uh, like 20 minutes or so, we'll be talking about logical operators, which allows us to combine Boolean values together to make something that's more complex. The first Boolean operator I want to introduce is conjunction, <coughs> which is a fancy word of and, A-N-D, and, okay? So it can be represented in many ways, okay? You can spell it out in this class as just A-N-D. You can use the, mathema the mathematical symbol, which looks like an inverted T. Um, you can also use and, and, ampersand, ampersand, which is the symbol or the operator that you use in C and C++. So do we have any questions about the various forms of conjunction that we use in this class? So it can range from spelling out A and D to the mathematical to the uh, C and C++ notation of ampersand, ampersand. Now, you have to use, you know, you know uh, all three, the code that you'll be writing? No, but it doesn't mean that you have to be able to recognize when I use the inverted V symbol, able to recognize that that means conjunction, okay? So there are only four possible ways to crank out value out of a conjunction. True and true is true. False and true is false. True and false is false and then false and false is also false. Is this consistent with your understanding of the word and? Yeah. Yes, okay. <clears throat> and
And I think, okay, I'm not a linguist, so I can only kind of speculate. In all natural language, there is a word for the same thing as and in English. Would that be correct? Does anyone know of any natural language that has no construct for the word and in English? All right. So it is a very useful um, operator in logic. <clears throat> the next one is disjunction. Disjunction is what we know as or in English, but it is not either or. So do not equate disjunction with either or. It is not either or. It is just a simple or. Okay, and I'll explain why that is the case. In terms of how we represent it, you can spell it out as or in a pseudocode program. In mathematics, it is it is it has a representation that looks like a V, but it's not really a V. <clears throat> And in C and C++ programming, the or operator or the operator is known as two vertical bars right next to each other. So on the keyboard, you just type bar bar, vertical bar, vertical bar. That means disjunction in C and C++. <clears throat> okay, so there are, once again, I'm giving you the various representation, you know, how we spell it out. But what is the meaning of or? Well, this spells out the of or because it gives us all the four combining values that can appear on the left, the value that can appear on the right, and what is the result of the operator when we operate on those values. True or true is true. False or true is true. True or false is also true. And then false or false is the only time a disjunction will give you an answer of false. Do we have any questions about disjunction, which basically is really the same thing as or? Well, then what about either or? <clears throat> when, you use that, if you, when you use those two words in English, when you say either A or B is correct, you are basically saying exclusive or, which means one and only one of those two options can be correct. They cannot both be correct. Is that okay? But, but that means, you know, when you're using either or, true either or true is actually false because you cannot have both being true at the same time. Okay? But in this class, you do, you do not have to concern yourself with the difference between either or versus just a regular or because you'll only be using regular or. Are we okay with the concept? Does everybody and the difference between either or versus just a regular or. We good? All right. The last one is the easiest one. I saved the easiest for the last because it is negation. Negation is all it does is to invert the truthfulness of an action. So it can be defined as False is true. So going backwards a little bit, this little symbol here, that's a mathematical symbol for negation, for logical negation. <clears throat> In this class, you can spell it out. You can just say not, N-O-T. Or if you prefer to use the C and C++ notation, it is an exclamation point. So if you use an exclamation point in C and C++, in front of a Boolean value, something that can either be true or false, you are negating the value of the Boolean value. So are we okay at this point? Okay. So now getting back to our example of finding the largest, uh, the maximum value of three variables, now we can express it. Now, once again, you know, this is not the only way to do it. It is one of the many ways to do it. But the focus is on line one. So line one does need the construct of a conjunction because in order to confirm that W is the maximum or the largest or one of the largest of the three, we have to compare and say, well, how does it relate to X? Is it greater at least? Is it greater than or equal to? If it is, that alone it's by itself is not enough to say that W is the maximum because we also have to check and see if W is also greater than or equal to Y. 
So that's why we have to relate these two expressions with an and so that we can confirm that both of them are both true at the same time in order to move on to line two. Then we can say okay, W is the maximum and Z can use its value. Are we good at this point? <clears throat> line three as it is right now is mm, not entirely necessary, you know, it, the, the conjunction is not needed, okay? Can someone tell me how, or you know, how we can simplify line three a little bit? Exactly. That is, that's a very good observation. So the answer is we can take out this portion. We can take out this portion here, and it would not change the correctness of the program. The reason why we can take this out is because we already know that W cannot be the maximum. So the only comparison would be between X and Y and see which one is larger. The lar whichever one is larger becomes the maximum of the two. But W is out of the picture at this point. But if you do it like this, you know, without erasing the highlighted portion, it would still be correct. It, it's just that you'll be using some extra time to evaluate an expression that is not important. Do we have any questions at this point about how we utilize conjunction in this case? No questions? Okay. Then how do we get to line six? Okay, I'm not going to show you the picture of the logic. I just want to see if you how we can get to line six. So how do we get to line six? Say that one more time. Say it again. Y is greater than both W and X, yes. So when Y is greater than W and X, we get to line six. But what does the program do? in that case. We start with line one, right? You look at line one and we say, well, if y is the largest, this comparison can still give you a true. But if y is the greatest, is the larger of the three, then this condition will be false. But somebody will say, but what if they're all the same? What if x, w, x, y are all the same? But what do you think is going to happen to this program when all three variables, w, x, and y, have 200, for instance. Yep. Yep, it will, it will go to line two. It will execute only line two because the condition of line one will then be true. So are there any questions about this code before we move on and start to trace in a spreadsheet? No questions? Okay. Any questions? I'm going to trace it in the spreadsheet and present a few different scenarios and see if we can get those things resolved. So let's see. We go to CISP 300. And since I'm creating the spreadsheet inside the share folder, you, know, you guys will have access to it. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just going to replicate the code here first, and then we'll, you'll tr you'll keep track of it. So we'll say if W is greater than or equal to X, and W is greater than or equal to Y, then uh, Z gets W, else if W is, oops, X is greater than or equal to Y, and X is greater than or equal to W, then Z gets X, else, oops, it's doing the auto completion. Z gets Y in this case, and if. And we want line numbers. Resize the columns a little bit, make it look a little bit bigger. 
like that. Okay. And now we can add additional tabs or sheets. And I need to refer to those extra sheets. So control C. We and drag this tab out. All right, so now we can look at both the code that we are trying to trace and the trace itself. Sheet two is basically our trace at this point. Um, let's zoom in just a little bit because I, I need to make sure there's enough room. So we have comments, uh, we have line number, and then we have one uh, column for each variable. How many variables do we have? <coughs> we got four variables because we got W, X, Y, and Z. Okay, so there are four variables for us to track. So we got W, X, Y, Z. <coughs> and the first row is always pre, which basically says, you know, what can we assume, you know, about the values, the values in the variables. In this case, we do need some assumptions because without any assumptions, we cannot do comparison. Because if I say W, X, Y, Z, they all have unknown values, then on line one, I have a problem. Because I cannot tell whether an unknown value is greater than or equal to an unknown value. It can be, it may not be. So I cannot you know, really track the program. I cannot trace the program. So we'll have to make some assumptions. So we'll start with um, what if they have the same values, right? five, five, and five. Okay, there we go. And z is unknown because you know, even, if, even if z had a known value, it is pointless because it is going to be overwritten by either line two, line four, or line six. So even if z starts off with a known value, it will, it will be overwritten anyway. So it doesn't make sense for z to start with an, a, a known value. All right, we execute line one. Line one doesn't change any one of the variables, but we do have to indicate the result of the evaluation of the expressions. W is greater than or equal to X, and W is greater than or equal to Y is true, because all three variables are actually the same in this case. Um, I think you guys might have a problem seeing the other columns. Oh, okay, it's actually, okay. All right, never mind. So where do we go? If the condition of line one is true, where do we go? Which line number do we go to? We go to the second line or line two, very good. So we go to line two. <coughs> line two is just an assignment operation. We look at the value of W, which is five, and then we put it into Z like that. <coughs> and then where do we go? <coughs> and then where do we go? Post, we're done. Okay, so this is important because this is one of the things to get confused with this code is to look at line three and go like, but wait, you know, if they're all the same, x is greater than or equal to y and dub x is greater than or equal to w is also true. It doesn't, <coughs> it doesn't matter because once we have chosen to take one branch, <coughs> and we have executed that branch, we get out of the entire conditional statement. Is that okay? So it's very important to understand that even though the condition of line three is also true, we don't care. Okay with this? <coughs> okay. So let's take a look at a second, a different scenario. Okay, so I can just copy and paste the columns because this will preserve the width of the columns too. It's just that after this, I have to erase a whole bunch of stuff and then we can work with a different example now. All right, so let's say they're not all the same, okay? And I'm just trying to figure out, you know, how to, uh, what, which, which other case we want to examine first. Okay, give me a way to change the values of W, X, and Y in a minimal way 
so that line four executes instead of line two. Make x greater than w. Okay. So make it six, for instance. Well, I I, I asked for the minimum change, right? <laughs> okay. So let's see if this works, right? Well, I think it's gonna work because x is larger than both of them, so it's gonna work. We'll see. So we start with line one again. Now, this is important. When you start executing a program, you always start from the very beginning. Okay? So line one is still going to evaluate the condition. But we know that it is not true anymore. W is greater than or equal to X is false. W is greater than or equal to Y is true. But this is a conjunction. So what is false and true? False and true is false, okay? So the entire expression, the conjunction itself, is false. So where should we go? Should we go to line two like last time? Nope, we go to line three. Line three evaluates a second condition, which is x is greater than or equal to y, and x is greater than, whoops, greater than or equal to w. Is that true or false? That is true. So now where do we go? We go to line, no, not yet. We go to line four. So when a condition is true, we go to the, we go, we execute whatever code is after the then that is next to the condition that is true. Is that okay? <clears throat> so now we go to line four and what line 4 is going to do is to copy the value of x, which is 6, into z. And then, with, and then what do we do? We name and then post. We're done. There was a question. Yep. What about line 2? We do not execute line 2. Okay. So this is where, you know, when you study, you, you might want to study this with a map, you know, on the other side. Because, you know, you're... Because this is the text representation of the trail map that we referred to earlier in class. And this is why it is important to read ahead of me. Because if you read ahead of me and you know, hopefully have it printed you know, so that you have uh, the, the notes you know, to refer to during class, then you can actually do a side-by-side -side comparison of the text version of the code versus the pictorial version of the code. But let me just kind of switch back to the pictorial version of the code just to explain why that is the case. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So getting back to the pictorial representation of an if then else if statement, if the condition is false here, go here, which is line two. Nope, we go here. This is line three. If the condition of line three is true, we go to line four. This is line six in our specific case. Is that okay? So the pictorial representation is much more intuitive, you know, because you can see all these paths are um, directional. You cannot go backwards or sideways. Okay? So most people can look at this and follow and go like, okay, I understand what to do with this. But the text representation you know, can be a little bit confusing because when you look at the text representation, okay, let me switch back to um, the code here. So when you look at the text rep representation, it is sequential. There's no other way to write the program in text other than sequentially. Okay, so current confusing you know, property to it. That's why you know at the beginning of beginning of the class you might want to look at both the pictorial representation and also the text representation side by side so that you basically remind yourself of how to follow the logic in a conditional statement. Okay? But I would only I would give myself about two to three weeks to get used to the text representation because after that, you know, we really should be familiar enough 
with the text representation without having to refer to the pictorial representation. So that's kind of what you need to do is to kind of understand the structure of these statements enough that you do not need to refer to the pictorial representation after two to three weeks. So are we okay th so far with this? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let me have one more test case then. So the last test case, as most of you probably already know what I want to do, is I only want line out of two, four, and six, I want line six to execute this time. Okay, so let me get rid of the stuff that I don't need here. And how do we get to line six? With Once again, with a minimal change. There are, there are two minimal changes I can make, you know, um, actually, there's only one, never mind. There's only one minimal change I can make to make it go to line six instead of line two or line four. What would that be? Yep. You should see that the two average condition should be false. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So in order to end up on line six, we need the condition of line one to be false. We also need the condition of line three to be false. Remember, the label for that portion, you know, in the pictorial representation of line six is else else, which means it's responding to false of the first condition on line one. It is also corresponding to false of the condition of line three. So give me one way to modify the values of w, x, y, and, uh, w, x, and y so that we get to line six instead of line two or line four. Yes? Yes, I can make y the largest, um, and I, I understand what you're saying, but it has to be larger than the other two. It cannot be, yeah, it has to be actually larger than the other two. <clears throat> Wait, hold on a second here. What did I just say? I said y has to be larger than the other two values, and not just one of the largest. And that's a difference, right? So if y is one of the largest, that would make y one of the largest, right? Because it is as large as x, and they together are the maximum of the three. But if this is what is happening, what would the code do? <clears throat> Which line is it going to go? It will go to line four, exactly. So in this particular case, it will still go to line four because, well, if w is five and x is six and y is also six, it is quite obvious that the condition of line one is false because it is false and false, definitely false as a result, right? So that will lead us to line three. So we look at line three. Line three says, is x greater than or equal to y? Yep, because they are the same. And then the next question, x greater than or equal to w. Yes, x is also greater than or equal to w. Then what do we do? We execute line four and not line six. <clears throat> I don't quite understand what is going on. I'm guessing it is a loose connection somewhere with my uh, HDMI converter thing. It's still recording, you know, don't worry, you know, that it doesn't affect the recording. It's just that I have to reset the uh, setting for the display, which is slightly distracting. There we go. We got everything back. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so this is not going to get the job done. We have to make y actually larger than the other two in order to end up on line six. So making it seven would do the trick. So we'll trace this program you know, at this point. This is line one. Since, w, since y is actually larger than the other two, w is greater than or equal to x, and w is greater than or equal to y is going to be false. And then we end up on line three. <clears throat> on line three, ev we evaluate x is greater than or equal to y, that is false. We evaluate x is greater than or equal to w, which is not really important because if one 
value to one side of a conjunction is false to begin with, the whole thing is going to be false. It doesn't matter what the other side is. So if the condition of line 1 is false and the condition of line 3 is false, then we get to line 6. Okay? Now note how we do not tra note how we do not trace line 5. Can someone tell me why we do not trace line 5? Sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I could not see who said that, but go ahead, you, you raise your hand. Um, because, well, okay, go ahead. There's no evaluation. There are no variables. It doesn't do a single thing. Yes, go ahead. Say again. Exactly. Else, well, not only is it not changing anything, it does not evaluate any condition either. The only purpose of line 5, which consists only of the word else, is to separate. What is it separating? It's separating what we need to do when condition 3 is true versus what we should do when neither condition 1 nor condition 3 is true. That is the purpose of line 5, which consists only of the word else. Okay? So in many ways, it, is, it, it serves as a punctuation, more so than it serves as a verb. It does not suggest an action. It is only there so that we can separate things. And as a result, we do not trace it because it doesn't do anything. All right. So on line 6, what do we do? We copy the value of y, which is 7 to z. Okay. <coughs> and then where do we go? Post. We're done. Very good. So at this point, do we have any questions about conditional statements or conditions or operators that work on conditions like conjunction, disjunction, or negation? No questions? All right. Then we are going to. Yes, go ahead. Well, if you use a disjunction, it will definitely change how it's going to execute. So if you, instead of an AND and you use an OR, that means if X is greater than or equal to X, I'm going to do this already. But wait, just because W is greater than or equal to X doesn't mean W is the maximum. What if Y is larger than W? I don't care because I only need at least one side of a disjunction to be true for the disjunction to be true. So you change the behavior of the program and it will no longer find the maximum of the three variables in certain cases. So are we doing okay so far with all of this stuff? Okay. If that is the case, we are going to move on in the module. <coughs> so when you scroll down this, you know, we talk about conjunction, disjunction, negation, back to the example. Um, this is a trace. We did, you know, our own trace in class with all the explanation. Um, and then this is the explanation of the ELSIF. The last portion of this uh, discussion has to do with in C and C++, because in C and C++ and many other programming languages, they do not have the word and if. So now the question is, how do we know the end of this? So this is, it can be confusing at this point. If it is confusing, don't worry about it, because this class does not test you on how much you know about C and C++. So as it turns out, in C and C++, okay, this is from the compiler's perspective, how it is looking at this. From the compiler's perspective, when I see the word if, I immediately expect a condition that is in parentheses. Okay, that's pretty that's consistent with our pseudocode, not a problem. In C and C++, there's no word of then. Okay? That really is just because, you know, the people who came up with C and C++ wanted the programming language to be as concise as possible. So the word then really is not needed because the action to perform is right after. We 
really need the word then to serve a purpose. Okay, that's not a problem. But here comes the big difference. The big difference is in C and C++, they only expect one statement right after the conditional statement. Okay, so in this case, Z gets X plus Y is the action to perform when the condition is true. And then if it sees the word else, it knows that, oh, there's more to this conditional statement. Okay, what if the condition is false? Once again, it is expecting only one specified when the condition is false. Because it's only expecting one statement after else, there's no need for and if. Because whatever is after this does not belong to the statement. You might ask, okay, some of you may have this question in your head, is what if I have many things to do for the then and many things to do for the else? What do I do? Because the compiler says you can only have one statement here, but what if I have like six different things that I need to do? Well, in that case, now I know this is a, a kind of ahead of time, you know, we're doing things that way ahead of time. In that case, what you do is you use braces. So let's just say that you got these two things you want to do when the condition is true. So what you do is you put a curly brace open here and it closes here. What happens is the curly brace construct is called a block statement. And the way it works is, it's kind of like a folder, okay? So when the limitation is, well, you can only have one file or one folder here. But I have many files that are going to stash over here. Well, don't use a file, use a folder then. So curly braces basically is a folder, and in the folder now you can contain as much as you want. Because the folder itself is con considered one single statement from the perspective of the conditional statement. Okay? So if you're getting this, great. If you're not quite getting this, don't worry, because in CISP 360, they will go over this concept over and over again. Because you know this is why you know, C and C++ can be confusing, because you have uh, assumptions that are kind of hidden, you know, it's not very clear and it's not very intuitive. Does anyone to know why we are using C and C++ as an instructional programming language when it is so confusing and not easy to learn? Because it was never meant to be easy to learn. It was never, it was never meant to be an instructional programming language. How many people know the origin of C, the C programming language? What was it used for? Who came up with it? Nobody knows. Okay, so whoever, so the person who came, the, there, there were two people who came up with this. They were working for Bell Labs at the, at, at the time. They were writing Unix, the operating system. Okay. How, how many people have heard of Unix? So I'm going to guesstimate that's about 10% of the class. Okay, that's okay. Let me ask you a second question. How many people have heard of Linux? Okay, a lot more, that's good, you know, about three quarters of the class. And then let me ask you another question. How many people have heard of either Android or iOS? Okay, I, I'm still only seeing about three quarters of the class, but I'm assuming the entire class on Android or iOS is, okay? Okay, so I just threw, up, uh, threw out a whole bunch of random stuff. How are they related to the topic at hand? So let me make all the connections. <clears throat> Android is based on Linux. iOS is based on what we call BSD, Berkeley Standard Distribution. BSD is a special version of Unix. Is that okay? Linux, on the other hand, is not really considered Unix, but it is a clone of Unix. In other words, all of the popular operating systems, especially on mobile devices, can trace their route all the way back to Unix. Without Unix, we would not have Android nor iOS. Is that okay? So that's how we, things connect to the present. Next question. 
Do you think Unix is a simple operating system? Yeah, I could have done it in the weekend. No, it, it, it's a pretty complex operating system. It was written in the late 60s and the early 70s. At that time, there were no C programming languages. So whoever wrote that program, um, I think Dennis, gosh, I can't remember, I can't remember his name, but I'll show you his picture. That should find him. There we go. Dennis Ritchie. He's one of the co-authors of the original Unix operating system. So he and the other person, I cannot remember his name either, um, came up with, you know, they were programming everything in assembly programming language. Now, let me just give you an analogy because, you know, no one here probably has the experience of writing an operating system or understanding the complexity of writing an operating system. So I'll give you an analogy. Writing an operating system in assembly programming language is like building a castle, a sand castle, using individual grains of sand and a tiny, tiny, tiny little you know, glue gun. Okay? It's extremely tedious. Okay? It's not impossible. It is possible. It's just very, very tedious. So this guy decided and go like, oh, I cannot do this, you know, uh, you know, because it's way too tedious. So he invented the predecessor of the C programming language as a tool. Do you think this guy knows uh, anything about programming at the time? Of course he did. He was an expert programmer on top of everything else. Okay? So he was making a tool for himself or someone of his own caliber and say, okay, here's a tool you know, that beat us up you know, significantly. You are talking about an expert level, experienced carpenter making a carpentry tool and going, okay, this will make my job a whole lot easier. So do you think you know, that tool is gonna have a lot of safety features? A lot of convenience features? A lot of comfort features? None of those, right? <laughs> that is C programming language. So here you are, right? You know, you guys are just getting into the apprenticeship as a carpenter. You just walk in with no knowledge of whatsoever of what a saw is, you know, what is the difference between a reciproca reciprocating saw versus a circular saw and whatnot. And here we are handing you a power circular saw with no comfort and no safety features. Just, just one word of caution, right? Watch your fingers. And that's it. Now go, go do something with your circular saw. That's kind of what is happening with CISP360. <laughs> now I have the slight advantage of being old because when you're older, you get to know older programming languages. Uh, older programming languages. So when I learned programming, I used Pascal. Pascal was invented by a professor with the intention of this is just an instructional programming language. Don't do professional programming with it, but you can use it in a class because it is really safe. We got tons of safety features. You cannot cut your fingers off. You cannot, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do in C and C++ that you cannot do in Pascal. But Pascal gives you a safety, the safety of a sandbox and go like, well, there's only so much damage you can do. Is that okay? Does everybody kind of understand, you know, when you move on to CISP 360, you know, you really have to be, you really have to be aware of the little nuances of C and C++ because it has got traps everywhere. <laughs> <clears throat> and by the way, this is also kind of somewhat interesting. Um, if you look at when this guy, you know, when uh, uh, Dennis Ritchie passed away, he passed away um, in 2011, October 12th. Does that date remind you of anything? Do you think it is close to one of the kind of other important dates? What is it? Oh, that's your birthday? Okay. That's kind of important. But if, let's look up the other guy who you already know. Does everybody know this guy? 
And then we look at his, the same information. When did he pass away? A week before Dennis Ritchie. Now, when, when it happened, did you guys know that you know, Steve Jobs passed away you know, when he passed away? Everybody knew, right? Everybody goes like, oh, what's going to happen to Apple, right? You know, what's going to happen to my iPhone? You know, what's going to happen to the next generation of iPhones and Mac, you know, uh, Mac computers and whatnot? Did you guys, one week after that, did anyone remember Dennis Ritchie also passed away? No. Huh? Right now, yes. <laughs> you just heard of his name right now. But the ironic part is, if it is not for Dennis Ritchie, this guy would have never been as successful. I'm not saying that he won't be successful, but he would not be nearly as successful. Because iOS would not be around. Mac OS X would not be around either, because Mac OS X is also based on Unix. So this is kind of the interesting and ironic part of you know, computer science. You know, two guys passed away within a week. One guy we know and go like, wow, this is a big loss to computer, you know, to the computer industry you know, because without him, we're all lost. And then the other guy passed away. You know, it's like, oh, that grumpy old man, you know, whatever, right? But as it turns out, the grumpy old man is what made possible, you know, all the devices that you have today. So that's kind of a cool little history of all that stuff. <clears throat> yes. Uh huh. Which one? Uh, Maxwell. Maxwell? Yeah. I do not know about Maxwell as a programming language. Um, it might be, but it's just that I'm not familiar with that programming language. <clears throat> All right. So this portion here, if you don't get it, it's okay. You know, no worries. Uh, if you get it, it's great because it it does help prepare you for the next class. So what we'll do now is, if you don't have any questions about conditional statements, we are going to keep moving on to the next topic. The next topic is about loops, okay? which is about repetition. How do we do something over and over again? Okay. So what we'll do is, eh, I'm going to use an example here, listing one. If you just read it out loud, you know, does it, do you understand kind of what it wants to express? Repeat, taking a bite until one is full, okay? So that means, you know, keep eating until you're not hungry anymore, okay? Kind of makes sense. Do you think it involves repetition? That's a, that's a pretty stupid question to ask because repeat is one of the keywords, right? Um, okay. And do you think we have to take at least one bite? Now, that is a quick tr uh, trick question. In other words, if you walk into a buffet and you're already full and you're instructed, okay, keep taking bites until you're, you're not hungry, okay? According to this logic, do you have to take at least one bite even though you are already ready to burst at the scene? The answer is yes. Okay, because this is what we call a post checking loop, which means you don't ask the question of can I quit until you have performed the action. The action is 9 2 in this case, and the condition to evaluate is 1 is full. Okay, when that condition is satisfied, then you can stop. You can move on to, you know, whatever is after this. So it's a, this is a post checking loop. So once again, you know, we want to be able to look at the text representation of a loop in a picture. So what is the picture going to look like in this case? That is the look of, a, of that same loop. Okay? Now, in this case, the direction is very important because this loop, this path here, can only go in this direction. You cannot go from here to here. Is that okay? That is one of the more important parts of this picture is you have to observe the arrow. Okay? 
So you come in here, which, which means you start from here. And do you have a choice whether or not to take a bite first? You don't get a choice because you cannot take this path here. You have to go into this portion here and take a bite. Okay. After you take a bite, this place where you have one way to proceed like this and the other way to proceed like that. So now you have a choice. Now every time you have a fork or a choice, you can expect a question. The, if the answer to the question is true, then you can get out of the loop and continue with whatever is after the loop, if there's anything. If the answer to the question is false, then you will follow this branch, go all the way around back to the beginning, and then take another bite. So is that OK? Does, is everybody understanding the concept of a post-checking loop? The name post-checking <coughs> is saying that you are checking the exit condition after performing the action. Are we good so far? All right. So if there is a post-checking loop, what kind of other what other kind of loop do you think exists? Pre-checking, Pre exactly. Because if there's a post something, it means oh we need to differentiate this idea from the other idea because this one is post and the other one by contrast is usually pre. Okay. <clears throat> so a pre-checking loop looks like this. Okay. This is expression about the same logic, but it's not exactly the same. So you can say, while one is hungry, take a bite, and while. So and while, once again, is really just a closed parenthesis for, all, you know, for the purposes of this class. It marks the end of the while construct. Okay. So what, is the, what, is the, what does the picture look like? So we'll skip to the picture first, and then we'll go back and do some you know, tracing. So the picture representing listing two is actually a little bit more complicated than the other one. So when you look at this, it does look a little bit more complicated. Because what happens is, you're coming from here. This is the beginning. You cannot take this branch. Okay, That is not a branch you can take right away. But you can. You do have a fork at the very beginning. You can either proceed through you know, to take a bite, or you can go around and exit the whole thing. So that choice is presented to you before you have to take a bite. Well, once again, if you're presented a choice, if you're presented a fork on the road, you always have a question to answer. So in this case, the, answer, the question to answer is, is one not full or is one hungry? If one is hungry, then you go to the branch that is labeled true, take a bite, and then what do you do? You go around and ask the question again to see whether you have to take another bite. Is that okay? This is called a pre-checking loop because the of the condition to get out of the loop performed prior to executing the action. Are we okay so far? Yes, go ahead. That's a very good question. So I'll repeat the question. The question is, what is the advantage of a post-checking loop over a pre-checking loop? Or what is the other around? OK, I, th I think it was. So basically, we just want to compare the two, right? When do we use a pre-checking post loop? So in this case, we want to use a pre-checking loop. Because if you walk into a buffet, OK, because you know, somebody invited you and go like, it's all paid for. Go Try to eat as much as you want, okay? You already had your dinner, okay? You're already almost ready to burst, and you go like, um, I think I'm gonna skip because I'm I, I ate too much already. In that case, a pre-checking loop makes sense because there's a possibility that you are not hungry to begin with, that you can skip the action of taking at least one bite. Is that is that okay? On the other hand, there are situations where post-checking loop makes more sense. Um, there's actually one uh, presented here. Okay, so if you think about a user interaction, you know, where you ask for a zip code, then you check whether the zip code is valid. If it is valid, 
we we can proceed and process you know the the zip code if it is not you want to go back and tell the end user and say well the zip code you just entered is not valid please re-enter right so in that case a post checking loop makes more sense because the condition depends on the action you cannot you don't have a condition to evaluate without the action that has to be performed again and again is that making any sense okay so now let me ask you a question. I know it's not fair because you guys are just starting to get into programming, but I want you to make a guess, okay? Just make an educated guess. Which one do you think is more common? A pre-checking loop? Okay, so in natural language, we use the words, you know, repeat until a lot more often compared to while, do, blah, 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 right? So, but in reality, in programming, uh, pre-checking loops are probably like 90% to the 10% of post-checking. So when you move on to future programming classes, the default, program, uh, the default loop should consider pre-checking loop. Unless you have a very good reason like this to use a post-checking loop. Okay? It's just a rule of thumb. I'm saying that all of the time you should use a pre-checking loop. But that is the first kind of loop you consider before you think, I might actually, in this case, use, I need to use a post loop. So that's a, that's, that's a good point. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I think it's time to do some tracing. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, go back to one of our spreadsheets. I'm going to reuse the same spreadsheet. There's no need to make a new one. So I just make a new tab and uh, make a new program here. So we'll go ahead and start with something relatively simple. So we say x starts with a value of 0. Let me just zoom in a little bit again. There we go. And then we say while x is less than 3, do the following. And what we do is x gets x plus 1 and while. Okay, that's it. That's the entire pseudocode that we want to execute. So the point of this exercise is kind of several, there are several uh, reasons to look at this particular example. One is to get a better understanding of what a pre-checking loop is and how it gets the job done. And the second one is to look at, you know, how we trace it, you know, kind of like the convention. How do we trace a loop like that? So on this side, I'm going to open a new sheet again and to perform that uh, trace. So with every type of trace, you know, we have a comments column, line number, and then one column per variable. In this case, there's only one. The precondition of this particular program says um, x can start with an unknown value because the first thing we do on line one is to overwrite it. Okay. <clears throat> so here is line one. And we overwrite x with a value of 0. Pretty easy. And then on line 2, what we need to write down is on the comments column, we have to say x is less than 3. Is it true or false? It is true. 0 is less than 3, so it's true. So not without me flipping back to the pictorial representation of a while loop, I want to see if you guys know where to go from this, from here. Where do we go? Go ahead. Line three. Very good. Okay, so we have to go to line three. Because line three is the action to perform when the condition is true. Okay? So we go to line three. Tech, um, isn't this kind of the same thing as a conditional statement? You know, when the condition is true, we go to the then statement. Well, just hold on a second here. Okay? You know, it is not the same and we'll find out what, how it is not the same. But before that, let's figure out what line three is going to do. Line three is an assignment statement. What do we do? What are the two steps of an assignment statement? Evaluate the right-hand side, come up with a value, and then update the left-hand side, right? <coughs> this is our right-hand side, x plus one. We just need to evaluate the value of x plus one. x has a value of zero at this point, 0 plus 1 is 1. So 1 is the value of the right-hand side. What do we do with that? Update the left-hand side. 
the left hand side says we need to update x well it just so happens that the calculation of the right hand side involves the same column as the column to be updated it's perfectly okay so we update the value of x by one and then what do we do not post we go back to line two okay we have to go back to line two because in the picture <coughs> Because in the picture, after you perform the action, you have to go back. You have to go back to right before asking the question. So that would correspond to line two in this case. Yes. So keep doing it until, x is three? until x is larger than or equal to three. Until x is less than three is false. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. But we'll, 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 we'll finish this. So we go back to line two, and then we have to answer the question again. X is less than three is true, because X is one at this point, one is less than three is true. Then we go to line three again. We increment the value of X, it goes from one to two. Then we go back to line two again. X is now two, but two is less than three is still true, right? Now we go back to line three, X is now incremented one last time from two to three. Where do we go now? Should we go back to line two or should we say post right now? We go back to line two, okay? Do not skip to post. I know that you know <laughs> that we, we are done. This is our last iteration. But in terms of the behavior of the program, we are going back to line two. Because line two is the only place that can make a decision of, are we done? Line three does not ask any question. Look at line three. Line three, all it does, well, okay, we cannot see it now. <clears throat> okay, let me switch back to, uh, to the code so we can see it. Look at line three. All line three is going to do is to change the value of x. It does not make a decision. Line two is the one that can make a decision. So when we look at the trace, we have to go back to line two, indicate that the condition is false, then we get to post. I understand that you know you may look at me and go like, well, you know, is that really necessary? Because we kind of know that you know, three is not less than three anymore. Why not you know make a post on you know row ten of the trace? I really need to be kind of specific in this case because you know, the behavior of the program has to be reflected in your trace. The idea of this class is you have to understand exactly what is happening in a program. Okay? Not, well, I kind of think that this is gonna happen. No, I, we need to know exactly how a computer is going to follow your instruction. Yes? Well, okay, once you execute line three, you don't have a choice. After line three, you always have to go back to line two in this, in this particular program. But from line two, you have a choice. Because from line two, you have a choice of saying, if the condition is true, yeah, we kind of have to go back to line three again. But if of line two is false, then you get out of the loop. Since we don't have anything after the loop, so that's why we can make a conclusion on row 11 of the trace and say post, because at that time we know that we are done with whatever is specified in the pseudocode. Is that okay? All right. Yeah. X is giving a larger Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So we'll go ahead and you know, uh, make another test case. Okay, so this time, okay, I'm gonna do it on this side. So we'll copy this and paste it here, and um, we'll change it to 10. Okay, that's all I'm gonna change. And then we want to see what happens to the trace. So we'll copy and paste the trace, huh? Well, we'll see. 
All right, so we look at the code on this side and then we look at the trace on this side. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> oh, that's right. Okay, I have to make some changes to here. We get rid of all this stuff and go from the beginning. All right, so this is a new trace of the new code the only change is on line one. Okay. On line one, oops, uh, wrong side. Okay, so on line one, x is now updated to 10 because that's the, what the new program is saying. We initialize x to 10. We still have to execute line two. Why? Because line one is not making any decision. If you, if you look at line one, all it does is to say x now has a value of 10, but it can Decision. It's not a conditional statement, it's not a loop, it cannot make a decision. So from line one, we have to go to line two, okay? So line two has to evaluate a condition. The condition it has to evaluate is x is less than three. What is the result? It is false. So if you go back to the picture, when the condition is false, what do, what do, what do we do? We get out of the loop, and in this case, we get to post right away because there's nothing after the loop. So that would be the behavior of this loop if we initialize x with a value that is at least three. I could change this 10 to three, and it would behave exactly the same way because three is less than three is false. Just like 10 is less than three is false. Are we okay so far with this? Okay. <clears throat> Um, well, if, if this is kind of, this is kind of cool, um, what if I change this and say, um, okay, so let, let me just be <coughs> careful with this, okay, and make a new sheet with this new modified code, and I say, you know, it's a minor mistake, right? And now I want to trace that code and find out what it's going to do. <clears throat> what do you think? It never, ends. it never ends. Exactly. So it's a very simple mistake that I that I just made. Instead of using less than, I use greater than. Okay. So logically, the same mistake can also be made by exchanging the order of the left hand side with the right hand side would have done exactly the same thing logically, right? But what is gonna happen now is if you just kind of go through this mentally, x starts with a value of 10 because of line one, okay? 10 is greater than three is true. So we get to here, x is now 11. We go back to here, 11 is greater than three, right? We go back to here, it becomes 12. We go back here, 12 is greater than three is true. It becomes an infinite loop. <clears throat> so if you write this code in C or C++ it and you run it, what do you think, what do you expect the computer to do? So raise your hand if you have an answer. Go ahead. <clears throat> It would not do any one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. It will keep executing the program until you turn off the computer, right? Go ahead. And it will keep going, right? So, but you're agreeing with the other student that it will keep going until you turn off the computer. Okay. Yes. Um. So you know, running the program, but I'll tell you exactly the computer will take a little bit of time depending on how fast your processor is, but with a modern i7 processor, you know, Gen 8, you know, Gen 7, or even Gen 5, um, it will take, I'm going to guess, like three seconds, okay? And then it will get out of the loop. It will get out of the loop, and you ask, why? Right? You ask the professor in the math professor and say, "This pro, what do you think that this program is going to do?" With you and say it will never get out.
But in reality, it does get out. The reason why that it will get out is because when we use real variables in a program, you can only allocate so many digits to a variable. Okay? How many people have heard of, oh, I got a 64-bit computer? What does that mean? Yep. What is, what is a bit? It's, what does it stand for? A bit stands for binary digit. You guys say, but we have never been introduced to binary digits. Fine. Think about it as just regular base 10 digits. You have 64 of those, which means you can represent big, pretty big numbers, right? 64, you know, base 10 digits, that's a huge number. But can you run out? Yeah. Yes. So when you get to, let's, let's think about a, okay, for the sake of, you know, easier to communicate, let's think of a um, five-digit number. So given a limitation, base 10, only five digits. It starts up with uh, 10, it becomes 11, and so on. But you only have five digits. So at some point, you will reach 99,999, don't you? Yes? Okay. What if you add one? You only got 10 digits. I mean, five digits, right? So when you add one to 99,999, it goes back to zero. That's what the processor is going to do. It just, go back, it just goes back to zero. And at that point, what's going to happen to your condition? Greater than three is no longer true. It will get out. Hmm? No. It doesn't bring any reason? It doesn't. Like it did out of the loop. Is that what it, well, the result is when it does get out of the loop, x has a value of 0, which is not what you would expect when this is, if this is a mathematical exercise, but when this is an inside the program, inside the computer, that's what it would do. Yes, go ahead. Sorry? It is not slow. It will take a little bit of time to execute, but then it will get out not the intended result. So how would this same program work with our compiled language so they don't have to say? If it's, yeah, so if it's not a compiled language, so we are executing the code mentally, and because mentally you do not have a fixed number of digits, so you can, in theory, it will never get out. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the program does not break. It depends on the programming language. In some programming languages, when you get to the largest possible represent as a variable, and you try to increment it one more time, it does break the program. It will give you an exception. So in Visual Basic, that's exactly what's gonna happen, which is preferred. But remember, remember what C is? It's a circular saw with all the safety features? No, it doesn't even Guard is onto a circular saw blade. <laughs> okay, that is why it doesn't catch that condition, which should have been a bad thing, but it doesn't consider it as a bad thing. It just keeps going. It's like, oh, 99,999, add one to it, becomes zero. Okay, let's continue. So, another thing you guys have to watch out for in CI360. Just remember that mental picture. Your circular saw is more with a saw blade you know, welded onto it. You, you, you plug it in, it starts spinning. There's no guard, there's no feature whatsoever. That is C. <laughs> so, yep, that's the end of today's lecture. Yes, go ahead. Um, I forgot, so that's okay. <laughs>